expect to have such a well, warm welcome and um, extremely grateful for this opportunity. And I look forward to a, a much more exchange, especially from um, the staff, the professors, and also from the students um, which are joining us today. So I, I am, uh, have met uh, Dr. Eki previously, which was in Nagasaki University. So I was uh, invited by him uh, to join this lecture, but I would also like to give my acknowledgements to the Dean of the faculty and also the organizers for very generously inviting me to this uh, lecture. So um, without due, I would like to share my slides. Uh, would you please help me to oh, share my slides? Uh, yeah. I don't have the permission to share the screen. Thank you. Okay, uh, committee. Professor Moy, can you share your slide now? Okay. Okay. Yes. Great. I can. I'm. I'm sharing my slides right now. Okay. So I was given the topic of uh, SARS-CoV-2 mutation and the implications in vaccine development, and so today I'll be talking on the virus itself. And I'll be also talking on the um, immune response um, towards vaccination and towards uh, natural immunity, um, natural infection. So I'll be talking from um, these two point of view. So some of my uh, information is based on the older version, which is prior to the Delta uh, epidemic. And some of the information includes that of the Delta epidemic. So what we have here right now is because of the variants of concern. So we really have to change all of our strategies on how we deal with SARS-CoV-2. So this is uh, something which is, again, unexpected, or we could also say expected because in infectious diseases, in all these virus diseases, there's always something new which is um, we, we which we could learn uh, much from it. So without due, uh, I would like to start my presentation. So this information is um, from Japan. It's a little bit old. I think it's on 2020. So you can see that um, I think most of the uh, countries, uh, other countries also have similar waves of uh, COVID-19. So during then, uh, in 2020, when it first started, it first started with several imported cases um, from Wuhan. Again, um, this caused the, uh, the first wave wasn't so big, but then it came in the European uh, viruses, strains from UK, and then uh, they gave a large outbreak. Again, it comes in wave, and I think it's about the, uh, it's, they call it the fifth wave right now. So this is up to the second wave, which is right up to last year. So the number of cases has been increasing, and of, to, of date, about 90% of the strains right now is the uh, Delta strain in um, Japan. So the severity in Japan, um, previously they have compared the severity and case uh, death cases in Japan per population. And it has been reported that it was relatively low as compared to uh, other regions uh, with similar number of cases of COVID-19. So again, this data was last year's information, and you can see that Japan compares well with South Korea, Australia, in a sense that there are lesser case fertility as compared to other regions. So there is a lot of uh, hypothesis behind this as to why there are lower case, uh, lower case fertility in the region. So it could be due to the um, variant, but I don't think this is really... Uh, really gives a large impact to the epidemic because these uh, variants are almost similar to what we see globally. It could be due to host factors and it also could be due to um, other uh, restriction factors, uh, including those seen in other uh, regions such as New Zealand and Vietnam, where they have tough uh, strict measures, including closing or closure of all the uh, districts or closure of those areas 
which are which have some outbreaks. So uh, in Japan, those sort of uh, measure, uh, those sort of control measures was not taken. They do have uh, policies in which they call the public uh, to have lesser frequent. Um, I mean, like to go out lesser at a lesser frequency. So uh, basically, it's a, a rule abiding nation, which means that a lot of people will uh, listen. They will they will take uh, into a consideration of what the government say. So um, the control measures which they've introduced is called three Cs, which is um, avoidance of closed space, crowded area, and close contact. So this has been introduced and um, that's some moderate success It's in this uh, measure in which uh, a lot of people is um, currently following uh, this uh, measure. So again, there is no restrictive laws in which they cannot punish you if you want to go out. If you want to, let's say, if you still want to go out regardless of um, all these policies, there's no laws against that. There's nothing to punish you or they're not going to charge you any fines or anything. But again, it's a uh, nation which uh, follows the regulation. So in, in a sense, um, it could be one of the reasons as to why there are low, low um, fertility rate in Japan. Again, of course, it's due to the uh, medical facilities. It could be due to the new technologies to detect and diagnose the disease. So these are also, um, they could, it could be due to early intervention measures. So this is directly related to that they have um, good access to healthcare facilities and they can access um, those healthcare facilities during the early phase of the disease. So this is one of the few reasons behind the lowercase uh, fertility in Japan. So um, as you can see, again, uh, this is how it looks like where they have, um, this is Pokemon Cafe. Uh, where you can have um, Pokemon uh, like uh, dinner or curry or something like that. So this is where they put all this um, soft toys in between so that you don't take up all the seats. And then they have regular, uh, they take the temperature regularly and they have introduced all these uh, screens around, especially in restaurants, in all those um, public uh, uh, facilities areas. So these are some of the measures uh, which they've taken care of. And also they've put on all these um, disinfectants um, around all the public areas and it's widely available. So everybody is free to use this um, in all the public facilities. So these are some of the uh, measures which were taken uh, in Japan. And I would like to go more into the scientific um, aspects as to what is exactly happening as to why we see all these um, changes in the transmission. Why do we see all these changes in pathogenicity um, during the past few months? So um, this is the situation in Japan. As I've um, introduced earlier, uh, the early cases were all import cases from China. And then the virus has changed characteristics as to as in clinical presentation, there were more cases. Um, these strains were imported from Europe, and then it has caused domestic outbreaks in which uh, you see that there's a lot of um, spreading of the virus strains within regions, within the whole country itself. So, and this is um, the data from Nagasaki. It's unique from other regions in Japan because it's located as the wet, at, at the western uh, part of Japan. So it's the western tip part, most of the Japan. So when we expect that the Wuhan strain has disappeared, from the country. So um, the national data has showed that by um, April, uh, and um, it's almost replaced by all, almost all it's replaced by the European strains. But then uh, we do see some Ch uh, Ch Wuhan strains, which is the original um, Chinese strains, uh, even uh, July, past July. And we do see some of this um, virus in circulation in December. So it is very interesting as to why are there no reports of all these, um, how these, we could call them older strains, 
um, in the uh, circulation of the uh, in the whole nation. But somehow we do see pockets of transmission which was not detected in some other parts of Japan. So the situation is unique. So it's telling us something that there could be some sort of transmission which is not detected and um, which was not picked up by the national surveillance system, but um, it is um, causing some transmission in the background. So this is the situation in um, our region. And then again, um, the, you can see that uh, right now it, it has been much more complicated when it entered this year. Um, there are lots of um, strains which the WHO has given names, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, kappa, and so on. So we can see that the original strain has almost all disappeared from many regions, but it's still maintained in um, some um, small uh, areas uh, in, in here in Japan. So uh, most of the strains uh, has changed uh, to the Delta strain uh, of uh, recently. So um, what are actually these variants of concern? So why are they so important? Why is everybody talking about these variants? So when we look at these variants, um, these are the original names. It's before uh, the WHO has given them um, specific uh, uh, gamma delta strains. So these were the original names where they came from. And um, some of them were of concern. It's because they have specific mutations which can cause higher infectivity, which can cause them to be easily transmitted. So this is why um, the WHO has called them variants of concern. So initially, they have identified them in UK, South Africa, and Brazil. So these um, three strains occurred in areas which has large outbreaks. So what we see commonly is that um, in areas which has a uh, large epidemics, this is where these uh, variants of concern would uh, normally appear. So um, after some work, uh, the WHO has given a better definition, has given clarity towards uh, what exactly are these uh, lineages and where were they documented and where did they first, um, where were they first um, detected? So these variants of concern again, um, why, why are they variants of concern? So they increase transmissibility. They have detrimental change in the COVID-19 epidemic, which means they cause much more outbreak than what it is um, we have seen previously. So these are uh, one of the reasons why it's called variants of concern. And there's increase in violence or there's a change in clinical presentation. And there's also decreased effectiveness of public measures. So regardless, whatever we do, for example, um, regardless whether we use all these um, measures, including um, we have all this distancing and we have all these diagnostics, vaccines and therapeutics, and these variants of concern may cause you to think of a different strategy of how to deal with them. So this is, this is the reason why they are called variants of concern. So other than the variants of concern, there's also the variants of interest. So these viruses are because they have um, genetic changes that are predicted to affect virus characteristics. So we, will, we could predict that maybe they are involved in transmissibility. They could cause much more severe disease. Or what we are concerned of when we are thinking of vaccines is to whether they can escape our immunity. And um, if they escape if they are all these escape, immune escape strains, so they could cause the um, how we rethink uh, all these vaccination strategies. So uh, right now there are concerns also in Japan as to whether the um, two vaccinations will be sufficient to address the uh, COVID epidemic. So again, um, these are some of the things uh, which we should think of. And again, there's also could be um, identified significant community transmission in multiple countries and as well as multiple clusters. And also it could um, cause apparent epidemiological impacts and also um, increase in risk of public health. Okay, so um, these are some of the molecular and clinical characteristics of the variants of concern. So again, it will affect the epidemiology. So it will cause much more higher outbreak, it will cause much more larger outbreak, 
than what we have seen previously. And um, some of the um, predominant mutations. So these mutations are important because these are where it could cause differences in infectivity. For example, these are the mutations which could increase how well the virus binds with the receptor or how well the virus enters into the cell. So these are the um, mutations uh, which uh, we suspect are involved in why are there such well um, epidemic spreaders. So these are the um, strains. So again, we keep in mind when we do vaccine design. So when we do vaccine design, we always question, are these um, strains involved in different um, antigenicity? So antigenicity will give you different um, immune response. And, and as to whether our immune response will be able to deal, will be able to give us protection against all these um, predominant mutations. So we also have to think about uh, these um, factors. Again, some of them were at the RBD, which is the um, receptor binding domain mutations. And some of them is spike, but it's non-RBD mutation. So it could be involved in how well the RBD uh, finally binds to the um, membrane itself. So clinical considerations, of course, if you have mutations in the virus itself in the RBD, it means that it could give you higher transmissibility in the end. That's the end product. And if you have better binding, if you have better infectivity, they may give you higher virulence. And then in the sense of host immunity, it could escape the um, immune response. So this is not something which we want for vaccination. And then again, because of these um, clinical considerations, it could uh, lead to lower vaccine efficacy and also effectivity. And then we have to think of new strategies of what can we do next to deal with all the strains. So uh, again, this is, this is just a um, associated consequences with all the major strains and um, alpha, beta, gamma. And we've also done some of our own um, experimental data as well. I will show you uh, later that the uh, gamma strains has lesser uh, neutralization ac activity in patients. So this um, global map indicates uh, where the local transmission or where the variance of concern is happening um, globally. So we see that there's a lot of um, changes in what sort of strains are spreading across globally. So I think uh, from 2021 and beyond, there's a interchange in the um, types of um, SARS-CoV-2, which are causing epidemic around the world. So there's a very huge increase in the Delta strain. So again, um, the Delta strain, these are, again, the Delta strain itself is also rapidly uh, causing their own a evolutionary um, progen itself. So it's also rapidly diverging from the original Delta strain. So the Beta strain itself is diverging again all these viruses carries out their own unique um, divergence uh, for whatever reasons. It could be some reasons because they have an innate um, reason. They have an innate reason for them to have survival. So this is why they have all this diverging out of the original strain to cause much more uh, transmission than that we have noted previously. So again, uh, these are some of the uh, spike mutation and privilege, uh, prevalence in the SARS-CoV-2 variant. So some of them uh, may not be uh, involved in the uh, immunity itself, immune escape itself, but some of them, uh, especially the, uh, the, the so some of them which con uh, this D61G, which all of them carries it, uh, some of them are um, important especially in the uh, receptor binding domain. So the Indian variant uh, has the D61G uh, mutation, and it's predicted that this causes a higher uh, interaction with the host cell and with the virus itself. So it means that this is why there are higher infectivity as compared to the uh, original virus itself. And again, uh, there's always a question as to 
what happens if you have patients with lower immunity. So lower immunity means that they have lesser capability to go against the virus itself. So in these patients with immunosuppression, it could be patients with HIV or it could be patients um, which are taking therapeutics to suppress their immune system. So it could be all these patients together as to why a, are these um, variants important is because when we do not have a um, immunity which is able to suppress the virus, a, sometimes it may cause the increase in variants and they have hypothesized that it may cause the increase in the uh, uh, variants a, and, and transmissibility in the end. So um, again, a sorry, this is the neutralization title. I'm showing that uh, this is against the original virus, against individuals vaccinated with the second dose of the vaccine against um, SARS-CoV-2. So um, they found that uh, against the gamma variant of concern, there are some uh, decrease in the neutralization titer as compared to the original virus. So again, um, I think this is the data from Israel. And um, when we look at the full change in uh, reduction as compared to the original virus, uh, there are some decrease there are some um, change in the uh, beta and also uh, to the delta strains. So uh, when we look again at um, another group's data, so this is the neutralization curve um, on to against monoclonal antibodies um, against different uh, viruses. This is the alpha, beta, and the delta. So when we look at the neutralization activity, so percentage of the virus being neutralized and um, so on. Again, um, when you are given different um, neutralization antibodies. So these antibodies are considered therapeutic antibodies. So they are um, actually used as um, potential therapeutic candidates. So this is where they see that there are um, differences in how they neutralize uh, the virus itself. So um, out of the antibodies which are tested, uh, there's a particular uh, antibody, which is uh, this monoclonal antibody, which no longer bound to the Delta variant. So this suggests that there's um, some difference in how we originally, I, th so these antibodies were originally um, isolated from either patients or animal models in which they isolate certain antibodies, which has high neutralization activity. So it suggests that uh, there are differences in the way these antibodies bind to the viruses itself. And these variants are actually um, causing changes in uh, the way the, they are being recognized by the antibodies. So this, is, uh, this also means that if you have all these um, potential candidate uh, therapeutics, it could not work for the newer strains. So again, when we look at all these um, convalescent samples from uh, vaccinated individuals, so we look at how are they uh, differences, are there any differences between the um, neutralization titers? Again, uh, when we, not sure whether this is, uh, okay, when we look at the AstraZeneca, there's a decrease in the uh, ED50 against the beta, beta and the Delta strain. So whereas sometimes the uh, difference between the alpha and the delta strain is not so huge. And um, in some of the uh, cohorts, it could uh, show lower neutralization activity. So, and, um, so where is this is just the neutralization antibody. It does not really mean that the vaccine is of lesser efficacy. It could mean in that uh, some other um, factors, which includes the T cell immunity or the um, uh, uh, or other uh, factors which are involved against uh, during protection. So here we come to the question of host immunity. So we've been talking about viruses. We've been talking about the strains. We've been talking about how these strains mutate to escape the immunity. So we have to look at it at both ways. One is at the virus 
and the another is that the host immunity. So again, I'm sorry, some part of it is in Japanese. I didn't have time to fully translate all my slides. So uh, when we look at host immunity, this is uh, this is actually taken from dengue because we work on dengue. So when we look at host immunity, there's a lot of things which comes into play. And uh, we don't just look at the virus, but we also look at if we're talking about antibodies, we, are, we were previously talking about neutralization antibodies, but then we have to look at in the neutralization antibodies, what are the components which are giving you all this neutralization activity? It could be the isotype class, because when we have IgGs, we have IgMs, even when we have IgGs, we have a lot of IgG1, IgG2, and we have a lot of isotypes. And what exactly are these isotypes which are giving you protection? And then we have also have to look at complement, neutrophils and macrophages and all whole hosts of the um, immune response, not just at the neutralization titer. So when we look at the protective levels, uh, over time, we do see a decrease in neutralization antibodies. But even if we see a decrease in neutralization antibodies, that does not mean that we are not protected against the virus because behind that, there are the B cells, there are the CD4 T cells, there are the CD8 T cells. So all these um, memory T cells, all these memory B cells will finally give a final contribution to tell you, oh, you're going to be infected by a virus. Oh, no, you'll be protected against the virus. So this, all the sum of this will tell us um, what exactly is our immune status and what, why are we ex are we protected against the disease. So again, uh, down here, we have the variants. So the variants will give you different response um, against your immunity. So um, the virus itself is smart. I would say um, it's nature working its way, telling its nature working its way, its way, and the virus will always adapt towards our immunity. And vice versa, our immunity will always adapt to the virus to give us protection against the disease. So um, we're looking at protection at this particular point, but on the other side, when we always talk about protection, we also talk about severe presentation. So on the other side of the coin, when we are looking at vaccine protection, when we're looking at the protection of against the disease, we will also look at ways to this immunity will give us severe presentation. So that is not what we want. So that is what we see in dengue. That is why we don't have a good um, vaccine is because we are not sure whether the vaccination will give us um, severe dengue or AD. Okay. So um, is there AD or antibody dependent enhancement in SARS-CoV-2? Again, there's a lot of theories in that. So what exactly is ADE, so you may ask? So it's when, when we have antibodies which does not protect us against the virus. And these antibodies are actually the bad guys. So these antibodies actually enhance the virus growth. Okay. So when we see all the antibodies being attached to the virus, for example, dengue in this case, it will cause an increase in the number of virus. Um, and there's two uh, types of ADs, intrinsic and intrinsic ADE. So intrinsic ADE will give you more viruses. Intrinsic ADE is where it works in the innate, innate immunity and gives you a whole host of cytokine storms. So this is two differences between that. So again, AD has two different types, which is called the FC gamma dependent pathway, independent pathway. And um, independent pathway has been suggested also in the SARS-CoV-2. So this um, does not have the FC gamma receptor. So FC gamma receptor is something which binds to the antibodies. So in this sense, um, the antibody binds to the virus, but does not bind to the FC gamma receptor. But it causes AD. So uh, we do have all this in vitro, and we have proven that there is um, SARS-CoV-2 AD in vitro as well, but we're not exactly sure what is it doing biologically. So we are not exactly sure, are these antibodies um, real or are these antibodies giving you all this whole host of problem when you have um, SARS-CoV-2. But for dengue, it's proven because you have secondary infection and then you have all these AD antibodies, which may increase the risk of the secondary infection. But 
for the SARS-CoV-2, it's uh, not as obvious as dengue. So why is this important? It's because we may have reinfection of SARS-CoV-2. And um, even if you are vaccinated, you may have a um, you may be uh, you may have risk of being infected with SARS-CoV-2. So this is some of the reasons um, that we should think of. So um, again, uh, when we talk about immunity, when we have a primary immune response, uh, there's always an increase in the um, antibodies levels as a whole. And then when we have a secondary immune response, again, we have a much more uh, stronger response. This is a boost response. So in SARS-CoV-2, again, there's a whole host of um, studies which suggest that if you have um, pre, if you were not previously infected with the SARS-CoV-2, but you were exposed to other coronaviruses, you may also have the same response that may or may not protect you. But again, um, it's also conflicting studies as to some studies suggest that you may be protected or you may have less severe disease if you are previously exposed to uh, infection by other coronaviruses. So why is this important? Again, it's because um, some of these single polymorphisms is actually associated with escape from antibody-induced immunity. So we are going back and forth with the virus. So some of these viruses are actually um, mutating itself to be able to have um, better transmission. Some of them are actually mutating to escape from our immune system. So they've detected some of the uh, particular strains which has this particular ability to uh, escape from our antibody-induced uh, immunity. So this again was detected in UK and there were several different strains. And also, I'm not sure whether this N439K um, has been going around, but it has been reported recently that uh, this particular mutation a, is, is in, involved in evasion against the uh, antibody response. So we have a whole host of um, mutations. And then if we put this in, it's like a constellation of mutations where you see that this particular mutation may be linked to uh, something else which cause a increased transmission or escape from antibody immune induced immunity. So this is a whole host of why we have to think of um, from the virus itself and also from the host immunity as well. And um, when we go when we go and look again at the vaccination, it's effective. It gives you IgGs. It gives you um, antibodies after uh, vaccination. Again, um, again um, if you look at all these mRNA vaccines, um, it gives you very good response, particularly three weeks and so on. After that, uh, it gives you good IgG response. Again, um, immunogenicity against this is good, but um, we would like to ask, for example, is this human response IgG or IgM, or does it involve cellular response, CD4, or CD8? And again, um, this whole host of immunity plays a very important aspect against um, our uh, protective response. So yes, T cells are induced, um, and it's also important for rapid viral clearance. And vaccine is also uh, has also induced um, T cells, which are broadly reactive against the variants of concern. So with all this data, we may say that for right now, the T cells are reactive against the variants of concern. And um, even if I, I, there's no uh, further studies right now as to how severe it is after vaccination and how long will this vaccination protect us against the virus itself. So vaccine breakthroughs against the SARS-CoV-2 variants has been reported recently. So even after vaccination, there are um, several uh, studies which has reported that there are um, breakthroughs. So I'm not sure whether to really call this breakthroughs or not, because um, this could be a totally different new variant as to what we are vaccinated against it. So uh, it could be, I don't think it, can be classified as secondary infection or a reinfection. It's 
something different. Uh, it needs a whole new different way of thinking of it. So it could be, uh, if we look at here, the vaccine break, oh, sorry, the authors call it this vaccine breakthrough infection in the SARS-CoV-2 variants. So um, the neutralization title is there. So they have neutralization antibodies against the virus, but they were infected uh, or uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 variants. So there could be two possibilities to explain behind this. So one is that the neutralization antibody here does not reflect protection. Well, that's correct because uh, they were infected with the SARS-CoV-2 variants. So this neutralization antibody title is, or our, or the way they measure the neutralization antibody is not good enough to tell us whether we are protected against the disease or not. Now, the second uh, hypothesis could be is that this is a whole new variant uh, which is not effective, which the vaccine is not effective against. With. But again, um, these sort of uh, reports, these sort of studies is still, um, there's still not many on it. So if you have a chance to uh, work on it in Indonesia, I would uh, really hope that someone could look into as to whether vaccination will give you all these um, breakthrough infections with other SARS-CoV-2 variants. So um, we have also have collaborations uh, with Vietnam and Japan. So Nagasaki has a Vietnam uh, research station. And I would like to introduce on some of the work uh, which we are doing with the Vietnam research station. So at the early phase, we're not exactly sure what sort of disease is this. So in um, 2019, we've perhaps heard, December, we've heard of, oh, there's a new infection in um, China, and then we should look out about it. And then we weren't thinking that it's going to cause a global uh, pandemic like this, because accordingly, SARS-CoV-1, um, the first uh, SARS virus itself, um, died down after some time. And... Um, after a while, it was definitely a different sort of uh, virus. It's different sort of disease. And um, we were involved in field work. We were involved in collecting of all the samples. And then there was some um, cruise ship. Okay, because Nagasaki is surrounded by sea and we have a lot of islands. There's 99 islands in Nagasaki. And I'm sure it's, uh, Indonesia has a lot of islands. It's 1,000 islands. 100 times more than us. So anyhow, there's a lot of cruise ship coming in and there are also outbreaks and online on board. And um, some of the problems was because um, they came down and some of the cruise members went around the city and there was some concern during then. But then uh, we realized that these are the measures that we should take uh, especially for cruise ship, especially in um, areas where you have people staying in the same small, not, not small, same limited area for some time. So um, we went on, we have, um, we went on and developed some of the, uh, validated some of the tests available. So initially there were no antigen antibody detection assay. When I said no, that was in 2019, December and um, early January. So right now there were over there are over 600 antibody antigen assays in just the WHO site. I, I'm sure there are much, much more test kits available, but our center was involved in validating whatever um, re, um, reagents or technology which um, may work or may not work. So we work with that with our um, counterparts. So uh, this is the very early phase of that. This was, this was when they came back with the Wuhan strain. Yes. Uh, when some of the travelers came back with the Wuhan strain. And um, they have uh, no symptoms, but uh, the data suggests that uh, they, they, they were carrying the virus itself. So all these carriers which were shedding the virus were asymptomatic. So these are some of the early clues which tell us how the virus is behaving in uh, these patients. So um, I'm going um, back to the um, antibody section, sorry. I'm going back to the immune response um, section. And um, we were also collecting some of our data. So what we were actually looking into right now is that we are collecting PBMCs, which is um, 
And also we're taking all the blood samples and we're looking at the uh, cytokines and looking at the risk factors which were involved in um, patients, especially elderly patients. There's a lot of elderly in um, our region. And so uh, we look at what sort of uh, a cytokines which were involved in severity and also with age. And then we have found out that there are some um, rheumatoid-like factors which were involved. Again, um, it will be interesting to look at into as to uh, what sort of pathways are involved in all these um, in all the when uh, in our immune response. So again, when we look at um, what sort of cells are involved in severity, we found that there's a T cells exhaustion in correlation with age and severity. Again, again, there are uh, a few reports on this as well. So in the early phase, there's uh, T cells exhaustion. So um, it may be one of characteristics of a virus um, response uh, against viruses, uh, especially for SARS-CoV-2 itself. So uh, what I always say that we have to look at the virus epitope and we have to look at the immune response. The reason is because we respond towards the virus and the virus respond towards us. So when we have different sort of um, infection with coronaviruses, and um, this sort of um, boosts our immunity or sort of gives us a background of uh, immune system against the SARS-CoV-2. So when we look at the Vietnam samples, this is prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. These are all uh, stored samples. We see that uh, some of the samples do have cross-reactivity against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is very interesting and especially it's in the Southeast Asia region. Now, I'm not sure whether you see similar data in Indonesia, but uh, we do see in Vietnam, there are some cross-reactivity. And it is, um, we, the late, in our latest data, it was due to the uh, common cold coronaviruses uh, from the epitope mapping. And um, the COVID-19 is a very special situation, which I'm sure you're aware of. Because uh, when we talk about vaccination, when we talk about dengue vaccination, it took 70 years and we still do not have a dengue vaccine. And for the COVID-19, it's just a few months. And um, right now, it's, uh, we, we see a lot of vaccine going on. So these are some of the uh, groups of um, vaccine, which are at the different um, clinical phase. And there's a lot of vaccines which are already uh, use uh, in many regions. So in terms of um, safety and efficacy, I think we are still doing a lot of um, homework on this. And we still have to do a continuous long-term monitoring on the safety, efficacy, coverage against different groups, different backgrounds, especially uh, when the large-scale studies are um, usually done first in the States or in the European countries, we, all, we should also check whether these are um, these have good coverage in other regions as well. So we also have to monitor relevant outcomes, including the adverse effects. So adverse effects has a few different types of it. For example, um, is it safe adverse effect or does it um, does not enhance the disease? So there's a lot of different factors to look at that. Again, um, the current vaccine uh, would need a a um, freezing, which is at minus 80 or minus 20. I think um, some of them will have a vaccine which is deployable, stable at room temperature, or maybe um, it can be transported to different areas and doesn't require refrigeration. I think the second and third generation vaccine will have that. And uh, the early vaccines were made um, based on the sequences of the original strain from Wuhan. And I think the recent strains, uh, which are undergoing clinical trials, are based on the Delta strains. So uh, it will be interesting to see what are the antigenicity, the data behind that, and how well does it protect against us, uh, against the new newer strains. So uh, I think this is often updated I think I got this earlier this year, maybe in May or so, 
So uh, they've tried to explain is this efficacy against variants. So this efficacy is often done by looking at the neutralization activity. So some of them is projected efficacy, which means that it could be um, just looking at the neutralization antibody levels, but not how well we are protected against the disease by the final stage as to how many patients they are. So this should be ongoing as to when there, uh, when there are new variants coming in, where the emergence of new variants, and you always have to do an ongoing study to see how well it protects against the other variants as well. So what we've been doing uh, right now, we've been looking at the immune system, we've been looking at the antibodies. And so the classical test for antibodies uh, takes into account, this is the PRNT test, which you will count how many uh, number of plaques or virus forming plaques which are reduced. So this particular test, you have to do it as BSL-3. So you have to use live virus for this test. And so what we are doing is that we are using uh, VSV virus right now. And um, these are non-infectious because they only carry the uh, outside uh, protein of the um, S, S gene. So what is interesting is that because this, with this, you can change this particular uh, amino acid, for example, um, which uh, you can explain that it will increase transmissibility or increase um, infectivity. So this is uh, something which can be uh, generated easily. As compared to the live strain, you will have to isolate it uh, somewhere from natural infection. So, okay, I didn't translate some of this. So what we were looking into as to what have been done in the previous study is that we are looking into the differences in the neutralization antibody titers uh, this is this is actually our dengue data. So what is the difference between the um, acute primary and acute secondary? So this is uh, second time infection. And um, when we look at the ADE, this actually measures how well the antibody um, neutralizes despite the absence of neutralization activity. So uh, this is something very powerful, which we are thinking to apply to uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 as well. So uh, I will just change a little bit uh, to our B cells study. So when we look at antibodies like this, so what we can tell is just the antibody titer. So we can't say what is giving you this titer, what exactly is behind all these antibodies, uh, which is giving you this particular, or let's say this is 100. So what is behind that? So we're trying to tease, we are trying to find out what is giving you this particular antibody titer. So when we look at that, uh, we are interested in looking into the B cells and the T cells receptor interaction. So there's something um, which is, comes from the B helper cells. So this is the uh, MHC binding phase and the T cell receptor. And we look at how this um, interaction gives you a particular uh, amino acid, which interacts with both interface. And from there, uh, we can predict uh, what are the epitopes which are interacting with the B cells and the T cells. So, oh, I'm sorry that this is uh, in Japanese. So from the B cell, B cell receptor point of view, when you have um, two different presentation by the CD8 cells will present by the MHC class one, and the CD4 T cells will present by the MHC class two. So when you have a particular virus which comes in, this particular antibody which um, recognizes the virus will be produced. But um, these antibodies will not be maintained for a long time in the BCR itself, but um, it reacts according to the um, genus um, hypothesis in which uh, these class of antibodies will cause idiotope to uh, recognize the uh, virus recognition antibody. So from this particular concept, uh, we've looked at all the SARS-CoV-2 uh, patients to look at what sort of B cells uh, receptor, a re receptor sequences, which uh, interacts with the virus itself. So we map back to the SARS-CoV-2 
And um, this is just data from one patient. And uh, this actually requires big data analysis. And uh, when we look at all these clones, um, we actually went through a few thousands of clones, but somehow in the uh, final analysis, there are only eight particular clones, uh, which we call it a TREM, out of the five different patients uh, that recognizes uh, the SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so when we look at the virus itself, uh, when we look at what sort of regions which is recognized in the long term, so we, we use convalescent samples in this case. So the protein which is recognized, um, it's all here. For example, it recognizes the NSP2. So the T cells does not just recognize the spike protein. So what this data suggests is that there's a whole host of different proteins which is recognized by the T cells. So it means that when we're looking at the um, antibody response, um, it's just uh, working at the spike protein. So we may question that, um, does it also work at all those regions which are the non-spike protein? But when we look at natural infection, so this is what happens. But that does not really mean that we're protected against the, natural, the second natural infection. But it's just telling us when we have a natural infection, this is a whole host of different response um, which is induced as compared to the vaccination. So um, this is some of the well, hypothetical wise. This is um, how we can look at it and how we can, for example, design a vaccine which reflects much more on our natural infection. So some of the regions uh, which are involved uh, and these are the number of patients um, we've looked at, for example, 20 patients and across 13 patients, um, all these, um, these uh, NS2 protein sequence is uh, recognized by this uh, particular uh, against the SARS-CoV-2. So, and um, when we look at uh, different variants of concern, uh, these are the different variants of concern and also again, SARS-CoV-1, MERS, alpha coronaviruses. And when we uh, look at the T cell response, it does not necessarily cross react with other uh, SARS coronavirus. And um, this is the uh, bad coronavirus. Again, uh, the, the cross reactivity is low, lower. This can be seen in green. Whereas um, in the uh, Vietnamese strains, these are from Vietnam patients and also the variants of concern, they are much more cross-reactivity when you look at the uh, T cells response. So it could mean that during natural uh, infection, it, ha it will induce much more better response, uh, response against the SARS-CoV-2 over all the different variants. So perhaps what we see in the antibody response is not as accurate as what we see in the whole um, immune response, which includes the T cell response. And I to summarize, a, the early changes in the SARS-CoV-2 genome has included single polymorphisms associated with changes in binding affinity in transmission and neutralization. So it's important to uh, sequence and also to look into um, your variants which are causing all the epidemic in the region for, for example, what sort of um, amino acid changes, this is called constellations here, that may alter binding affinity transmission and neutralization or perhaps vaccine efficacy. So pre-existing immunity to SARS-CoV-2, it may alter our immune response and in turn disease outcome and response to vaccination. So if you have a chance to look into, if you have banked uh, your samples previously, perhaps you can also look into pre-existing immunity as to whether they are these um, response in um, the Indonesian community and how um, this person has um, responded when they have disease, when they were infected with the SARS-CoV-2 itself. So virus, you can't just look at the virus itself. You also have to look at the host immunity. I, this is the Department of Pharmaceutical, ph uh, pharmaceutical Department. So, sorry, I didn't involve any therapeutics this time. <laughs> it's just mostly on host immunity. So, um, sorry. Okay, so the final one will be the capacity of the viral genome to change further and how immune system response to it changes is not known. 
but further studies is um, essential. So I would like to thank you. There's a lot of people which would I which I would like to acknowledge, and of course the organizers, which um, gave me an opportunity to uh, interact with the wonderful team from University of Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your interesting presentation, Professor Moi. Uh, and then we have to continue to discussion session. Is there any question from the participants? You can write on the chat room or raise hand to ask your question in person to Professor Moi. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, Muhammad um, Fahro Rizal. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Rizal. I want to ask uh, you. Uh, actually, in a pandemic time, uh, uh, from the facing to COVID nineteen variants of concern, which uh, which means Delta uh, or etc. Uh, which is our priority in now uh, increase health protocol or increase our antibodies such as from uh, COVID-19 exposure uh, in in started or by vaccine uh, or this okay uh, you can tell uh, about uh, this choice uh, thank you okay. thank you Pastor Lisa okay uh, Professor Moy can you open your video <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. Okay, there's some time <laughs> lag between that. Uh, well, the most, I think, <laughs> I'm just talking from common sense here. <laughs> it's that it's important for you to protect yourself. Of course, uh, you have to distance yourself away from the, um, the origins of infection. And sorry, hold on for a while. Have we choose one of that alternatives or both of them? We so sorry do, about yeah. that. So sorry about that. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, and I will definitely say that vaccination is very important. So I think uh, I, I can't really tell from the clinician point of view because there's a lot of um, thoughts going on as to whether you should be vaccinated or you should not be vaccinated. But again, um, vaccination is one of the basic ways to um, keep us, um, uh, I would say, protected against the disease, but then against uh, risk of severity also, you have to also think about that point. So um, you have to protect yourself, also follow the regulations and follow the um, what your Ministry of Health has introduced. And also, I'm, I think there's a lot of information going on right now as to, uh, yeah, it's okay, you can go out, it doesn't matter, or it doesn't matter that you don't have to vaccinate it, be vaccinated. But I think um, you have to think smart in this sense. You have to protect yourself and you also have to protect um, those around you. So I would say that um, vaccination is one of the important steps to begin with um, all these uh, control measures. So we have to do both of that vaccination and the protocol, health protocol. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, thank okay, you. Thanks for your answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, next. Mrs. Aini Busmira. Um, thank you for your interesting talk. So I would like um, to ask about the, um, the antigens, the universal antigens. But um, before that, um, so uh, we know that the variants uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 differ from each other based on the mutation on spike proteins. And also the current vaccines also target the spike proteins. Uh, but uh, as you show, uh, when you, uh, but you, you show in your presentation that the T cell actually can target um, other antigens such as um, NSP3, oh, I'm sorry if I, uh, am I, am I, if I'm mistaken. 
And uh, my question is, um, do the scientists now also look into uh, or try to create the vaccine that target other proteins? Uh, and also, do you think it's possible that uh, uh, people find uh, the universal antigen for the vaccine? Uh, so that's all my question. Thank you. Uh, yes, the scientists are currently working on, on that. And I think the third, second generation vaccine is probably on the Delta strains. But the third generation vaccine will probably work on the um, uh, regions other than the spike protein. So they are working on that. But the reason behind spike protein was chosen is because that is the uh, main uh, protein which the virus depends on to enter the cells. So that is the main reason why the S protein was chosen. But it does not necessarily mean that uh, we don't have we we can't choose other regions. I think it's um, interesting. It's also important for us to look into that. But the reason is because it's dif it's difficult. Is because uh, I'm sure all of you are students and uh, in the uh, and also staff for the pharmacy pharmaceutical um, department. So you know that the protein has also folding structures, 3D structures, quaternary structures, which um, it's very difficult to predict what gives you this particular uh, antigenicity, what gives you this particular response. So what the uh, third generation vaccine is doing right now is that they are trying to um, look for all these T-cell recognition epitopes and they're trying to join it together into a giant protein and also probably by mRNA vaccination or whatever platform they choose. So this is um, some of the ways they're looking at what they're doing it, um, some of the strategies they're doing it. But uh, we're not exactly sure uh, is that going to work. Um, we, we have to see, for example, um, these are the patients which are not really infected. So what I've shown you previously does not mean that they are not infected, reinfected, or they can be protected against the disease forever. So it's just an indication of how we respond um, towards the virus naturally. So again, we also have to look into uh, whether all these synthetic materials will give us um, the response that we desire. So this is uh, what WHO and what um, the Bill Gates Foundation is also looking into right now, the third generation vaccine, which... Uh, which gives you efficacy against all coronaviruses. I think that's a very difficult thing to do because all of them behaves differently. All of them has um, different antigenicity. As you can see in the previous slide, even you're infected with a particular virus, uh, you are not uh, responding well against the other coronaviruses. But what they can do is, um, as to what they have done for dengue, is that they um, vaccinate against all four viruses at the same time, which means a single dose has um, four different viruses at the same time. So uh, that has been done, but you, you know the result is not working so well. So um, for me, I think it's a very difficult thing to do. So the most straightforward answer will be uh, to do a particular uh, SARS-CoV-2, and then you move on to other coronaviruses. Thank you for the answer. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Aini Gusnira. Uh, next question is from Nada. Thank you so much for the awesome explanation. So I would like to ask one question. Like uh, in Indonesia, we have lots of uh, Sinovac vaccine, but as we see on the data that um, the more effective for uh, Delta variants and another variants is AstraZeneca and, and I mean like not the Sinovac, mm, not the Sinovac one, but do you have any recommendation? Like maybe we have to take uh, any booster for those who has ever been uh, vaccinated by a uh, Sinovac vaccine or something like what? Uh, that's my question. Thank you so much. Right now, I 
think um, in this situation in which we probably have a, um, not enough vaccine in the circulation right now. So uh, what we are doing right now, it's probably something which uh, we're doing not out of normal times. So we'll receive whatever vaccine which comes in our way. I think um, that has been done in um, a lot of uh, regions as well. So and as to whether you require a boost on, uh, or not, so I think Sinovac has also presented some data that works against the Delta strain. And maybe the antibody is not giving them as high as compared to the other um, manufacturers, but uh, they've shown data that it works against the Delta strain as well. So I may also foresee that we probably need a booster dose and we'll probably need to, um, we probably need newer uh, vaccines. I probably foresee that um, in the future. But uh, right now, uh, we will have to take whatever we come sh- which comes in our way. Yeah, because it's, it's an emergency situation right now. So this is how uh, we should deal with it. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay. Uh, when, when the situation is getting normal, uh, how long ideally we get the booster? And uh, do we have to check the, the neutralization antibody to get the booster? Okay, as of date, I have not received any information that WHO is recommending the booster. So I think uh, we still need some more long-term data, for example, two years on, five years on. Mm-hmm. And also we have to look at the epidemic uh, situation. Okay. It seems like the SARS-CoV-2 is here to stay. But uh, we also have to look at the VOCs and the VOIs and how they interact with the transmission and the uh, global public health. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there are two questions in the chat room from Mrs. Ratik. Uh, how, how is the change for development of universal corona vaccine? Yes, I think someone asked the same question. Yeah, similar question with uh, Mrs. Aini before. Yes, okay. so uh, possible, but I, I think it's a very challenging. Yeah. Okay. okay. And from uh, Mrs. Karpika, dear Professor Sormoy, is it correct if we consider mRNA based vaccine is more dependable facing coronavirus mutation than attenuated live virus vaccine? I'm not sure we do we have any attenuated live virus attenuated uh, maybe inactive virus inactivated, inactivated, yeah, inactivated, yeah inactivated live virus so um, the mechanism is different a mRNA based vaccine has a totally different mechanism as compared to the attenuated live virus but uh, because when we receive the um, sorry inactivated live virus it comes in just as a protein. It comes in as, as how it is. So in a sense, maybe the stimulation of our immune response is um, not, as the, not the same as that of the mRNA vaccination. So yes, um, I wouldn't say it's dependable or not, but it's a totally different um, mechanism uh, of vaccination. So both of them has their merits and demerits. Um, but uh, in all, they would all they would say that the inactivated is a very safe vaccine. But uh, whatever it is, you always have a small risk uh, when you're having vaccination. Yep. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Kartika Chitra, is that answer your question? Okay, I hope so, yeah. Uh, from Kartika Fidi Astuti, first of all, thank you very much for the amazing presentation, Prof. Uh, I would like to ask the following question. How to choose a factor and codon sequence according to the mutation of the virus so that an effective vaccine is produced? Second, what is the difference between the result of developing a vaccine using restriction enzymes and oligosynthesis? Sorry, I vector and codon sequence. 
according to the mutation. Okay. So uh, I think uh, you probably mean that whether it will synthesize this sort of protein, which you are interested in. So when we talk about vaccination, when we talk about producing all these uh, vaccines, it has to give you this certain antigenicity, uh, this certain immune response, which you desire. So uh, when we look at optimization, uh, I think there are several uh, software which you can do that. That's one. And another would be to do the animal studies. And um, you always have to do it in vivo to test whether it will give you your desired uh, results. And the second part is that restriction enzymes and uh, I'm not sure whether we use restriction enzymes, but we, uh, yes, sometimes we do use uh, we do synthesize oligos for uh, vaccinations, but mm, yeah, it all depends on your techniques. Yeah, again, you have to go back and uh, optimize in vivo, especially. But whatever we see in vitro, whatever we do, predictive studies, modelings, and when we do it in vivo, sometimes it don't work at all. And we've done that, we've tested that. And um, you always have to go back in vivo and test whether your model works or not. That's why we call it research, research, <laughs> research. <laughs> okay, uh, next we move to the participants that raise uh, their hand. Willy Leopati. You can uh, ask in person to Professor Moy. Thank you. So my name is Willy Leopati Johandi from Batch 2017. So based on some research that I do by reading a journal, um, the virus death in surface area in three hours and the longest the longest is on the plastic, which is need two weeks to make the virus death. So I think after there is no host for this virus, at the end, this pandemic will end. So from your point of view, um, will this pandemic become an endemic? Because I think if there is no host for the virus, it will, the pandemic will end. Thank you. Uh, you mean there's no host uh, that will be infected by the virus? Uh, yes. Uh, and, okay. When uh, there are no cases again, so the pandemic will be end. Do you think yes, like that? Yes. <laughs> We've seen that for SARS, SARS right? The SARS-CoV-1. Mm -hmm. So the, pan the epidemic ended just like that, just when it came out suddenly and then it ended suddenly. So if you don't see any more cases. If there's no spreading, uh, then it will end. Mm -hmm. But... The reason for this SARS-CoV-2 is that uh, it, from what it looks like, it doesn't uh, give you a full immunity. It gives you, probably gives you a partial immunity or something like that. And then you can be reinfected with the virus again. Or it's some sort of complicated mechanism as compared to the SARS-CoV-1. So most likely you probably see it for some time. And um, it will... Um, I can't predict anything, but maybe it'll end up like the common cold coronavirus. But we also have to think about a better strategy for vaccination and control because uh, we, we can't stay like this all the time. So we have to think of better measures uh, against this. And so is there any chance the virus mutation until they cannot infect us? Is, is there any chance? Okay, mm -hmm. right. So if you look at how they are in, evolving right now, it seems like they're evolving towards infecting more humans. So uh, the ones which does not infect well, they will actually die down from the uh, transmission. So the ones which are actually surviving right now are the ones which uh, infects well. So yes, the way they are evolving is to infect more people instead of the other way around. Like, so this is what we see. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next, we move to the next question. Mrs. Luin. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I want to ask a question about uh, SARS-CoV-2 
vaccine in patient with immunosuppression. So are there any certain vaccine option for someone with autoimmune comorbidities? Like uh, as we know, there is uh, several kind of, uh, kind of vaccine like inactive virus or mRNA. So uh, is there any uh, certain vaccine option for someone with autoimmune comorbidities? Thank you. Uh, immune compromised patients or those uh, yes uh, okay. especially, especially yes. the autoimmune patient yes oh okay so um, these are special group of patients and um, we are not certain how the vaccine will respond or how they will respond we respond against our vaccination so we have to look at two things in this um, group of special patients, um, for example, adverse effects, what sort of effects um, will they get when they get the vaccination? And number two is that even if they uh, receive the vaccination, will they be able to generate the immune response um, incomparable to those of the normal population? So I have no specific recommendations for this group because um, these, are, these are a special group. This is a special group. And um, there's still ongoing studies as to what sort of um, vaccines uh, will do um, will be uh, optimal for them. So I think this is a case by case because uh, all of them have different sort of immune response. Autoimmune patients have may have different immune response, and someone with HIV may have different immune response if their CD4 cells are not working. So um, it's a it's really a case by case, and we can't group all these patients into one um, big group as to how you can vaccinate these people. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have uh, four more minutes. I will choose uh, three questions maybe. First from Mrs. Ratika, their professor Mao. Uh, do you think inactivated vaccine will induce cellular immunity? Yes, so long as the cellular immunity is how you present the antigen uh, in the T cells and how they present it to the B helper cells. If this particular inactivated virus uh, respond, uh, gives good response in the T cells, yes, it can be induced. And I think there are many studies on that. But um, the thing is that when you have infection or when you have an mRNA uh, response uh, vaccination, that will give you a totally different uh, presentation as to the uh, inactivated vaccine. But um, the short answer is yes, uh, it will be able to induce um, cellular immunity uh, with inactivated vaccine. Second question, what will happen if we take different vaccine in the first and second shot? Okay, I think uh, there's a lot of arguments uh, going on here if you have different vaccines in the first vaccination, second vaccination. But um, there are some studies which shows that it's much more effective if you have different vaccines um, in the first time as compared to the second time. I really can't say much on this, but it could be because when you are given a different um, sort of vaccine, it probably targets somewhere else. So this is the reason why um, it may give you a better uh, immune response as compared to the uh, same vaccine for the first and second time. But uh, I don't really recommend that. So what we can do is that it's better for us to get the first and the second one with the same vaccine because um, it's it's different from all the studies which has been done uh, when it's done, when it's in a clinical trial. So when we always when we think about vaccination, we will always think about we want to avoid adverse effect and we don't want something which is um, different from the results that we are expecting. So we want consist consist um, consistency when we are looking into vaccination. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question, maybe from uh, Mrs. Aini. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, it's me. So um, I would like to. Um, so my question is, um, uh, why people get infected more than one, more than once? Um, uh, does the problem lies with B memory cells, or 
uh, does our, I mean, does the body forget about the virus? So uh, these people get infected more than one. And is there any data that show that um, people get infected more than twice? Yeah, so I'm just wondering. Well, I think that's an interesting question. So uh, the SARS-CoV-2 itself, you may be, so there may be a person which may be infected with it, but does not induce a good immune response that will protect uh, against the virus in the future. So when I mean a good immune response, it could mean that the antibody response, uh, antibody response was not sufficient or the T cell response was uh, not sufficient enough, sufficiently induced to deal with the virus in the second time. So uh, it, it, there's a lot, whole host of uh, factors behind that. I think most likely it's due to the host factors. And I have not seen those uh, data yet on you are being infected with beta, beta strain and the next one, delta strain. So um, what they've shown recently is that... Uh, infected for the second time, but uh, the symptoms are lesser. So this is the main trend. And um, in some people, they are severe presentation, but uh, most of them were less severe than the first infection. So it could suggest that um, it's partial immunity working, and but it is, working, it is not working as good as to protect against the virus. So I... Um, that that could be one of the reasons behind that. Uh, so, what about the? Um, I'm just I'm still wondering about the B memory cells. So, uh, mm. uh, is there any data that um, uh, how to check the B memory quality or the number of these B B memory cells? So, um, so we know that this mem B memories, uh, this B memory cells that are uh, uh, has the you know um, they 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 work on the uh, they 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 create uh, they create they help creating the help the help they help create the antibody. So um, I'm just wondering if uh, any data or, or uh, the scientists uh, out out there uh, work uh, are working on uh, to check uh, the B memory cells quality or quantity or yeah, uh, something like that. Uh, yes, uh, there are a lot of um, information going on, working on the B cells. So uh, if we are to look into, B, into the B cells quantity and the quality of it, we'll have to look at long-term data. So again, uh, this information is still new. So we just have the virus uh, in, in the beginning of 2020. So it would be interesting to do a follow-up, but most of the studies have shown that uh, you have neutralization antibodies one year up after infection. So most of the studies has pointed out that uh, you do have functional antibodies produced even up to one year after infection. But I think there were lesser studies on the B cells. So it will be also interesting to look into them and particularly what exactly is behind uh, the uh, B cells, what B cells are involved in protection against the disease. So I think that is, um, you pointed out something very important that we should also look into. So the question is that, do we have um, longitudinal uh, cohort to do that? Do you have the same patients taken from the uh, early of the year, for example, or one year later? So it's very important to look for all these patients and you need to have your infection history. Okay, thank you for your answer. Okay, uh, Professor Moy, do you still have time? Because I heard before that uh, your time is limited. If you still have time, uh, can we answer more questions in the chat room? Okay, just give me a minute. Yes, I think we can, just hold on, okay. okay. Thank you so much. Okay.
Okay, yes, uh, I think we can continue. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, dear Professor Moy, I would like uh, to ask a few questions. Okay. With each strain and each mutation keeps growing mm-hmm. each day, does mm-hmm. that make the older variant of vaccine is obsolete compared to the new one? <laughs> a very good question. I think a lot of people is interested into uh, looking into that. So, for example, uh, the second generation, third generation vaccine will have uh, the newer sequences which carries the uh, Delta uh, sequence or, or the Delta variant sequences. So, uh, I think it's very important because it gives you different antigenicity as compared to the older strain. So uh, the reason behind that is that if we are to uh, always continue looking into newer strategies, new vaccines, so that's the reason I'm concerned as to whether you can really uh, fight off the epidemic with just the current strategies that we have now. So um, you're right on that. The second generation vaccine will have um, the newer sequences Uh, which will have better antigenicity and perhaps protection against the uh, uh, later variants. And how fast the mutation is growing before our current vaccine cannot handle the new mutation? And is it something we need to concern about? Yes, uh, it will depend on how well uh, we can do all this, uh, introduce all this uh, newer Uh, vaccine strain. So the reason behind why the mRNA vaccines are better as uh, compared to the older types of vaccines is because we can introduce all these um, specific mutations, which we think will give you better antigens, they will give you better protection. So it's a faster strategy as compared to the uh, older, older uh, methods when we are thinking of vaccination. And dear Professor Moy, I read from Frontiers, declared that viruses carrying G variants were significantly more infectious than original D614. Why did this happen? Okay, so the virus itself is a product of nature. And the product of nature means that they want to have survival. So like uh, one of the, um, someone mentioned just now that if you don't have any more cases, then you won't have any more uh, uh, infection. So it means that the virus itself would want to survive. And to survive, uh, they will have to beat off the host immunity. So to do that, uh, they will have to keep on having uh, different changes, different variants for them to continue to produce their progeny. So that is the reason why we see that uh, all these variants are um, significantly more infectious as compared to the original strain. Now, if you have a virus which is highly pathogenic and it kills off all the hosts, they will just die off. So the reason behind as to why we have a virus which is which better transmit is because they don't kill off the host. It's at a particular balance point in which they will give you good transmission, but it's not as severe as to where they kill off the host. So that is not a good strategy for the virus itself. So uh, the host immune response and the virus itself, um, the host immune response actually drives the virus to how it gives you this particular uh, strain. Uh, and then the next question from... Uh, is it true that the vaccine cannot be given to people who have comorbidities, for example, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, uh, coronary heart disease, and others? And if yes, then is there a solution that can be given to these comorbid patients? Well, I think uh, these patients are again uh, special group patients. Mm. It's they they are not the same as the immunocompromised patients, but uh, they are considered groups which uh, you have to give them the vaccine with care. So any adverse effects which happens to this group, they will have a higher risk. 
they will always carry a higher risk as compared to the normal population. So that does not mean that the vaccine is not uh, safe against um, them, but uh, when you're giving the vaccine to this group. So it just means that you have to be aware that this group will have extra risk and um, it's not those uh, risks which you can be considered uh, in the normal population. So this is what you have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, uh, but there's a risk if you are planning to introduce all these vaccines to them. And next, uh, there, are, there is a question from Professor Amarila Malik. Professor Am mm. Amarila, would you like to ask in person to Professor Moy? Okay, if not, I will uh, read the question. Does it relate to ACA2 expression level for SARS-CoV-2 mm. SARS and 3? Uh, yes, it's related to the expression levels because uh, when you have uh, certain cells which expresses this SARS-CoV-2, I mean this ACE2, so it serves as a receptor and it serves as a better entry point for the uh, virus itself. So yes, uh, it's related to the expression of ACE2. But um, it's, it's not exactly exponential, maybe, but when you have a certain optimal point of the ACE2, optimal levels of the ACE2, then it will give you a, uh, a much more better infection as compared to the other non-ACE2 cells. Okay, uh, next question. What are the aspects used to score the fit age group for vaccine acceptors of each vaccine types? Aspects to score the fit age group. Mm, I sorry, I don't really uh, get these questions, this question, but uh, aspects to score the fit age group. I think um, it's they are excluding children right now and those which are elderly, which is above uh, 60 or perhaps uh, 65. And um, the score for that, I, I don't think they have the exact score of, for that. But again, um, it's because it's considered under the age, uh, it's, uh, it's considered under the risk group if you are over 60 or 65. So, uh, but again, uh, like here, for those um, individuals which are over 65, they're giving the vaccination first, priority first. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that's exactly an aspect for this consideration, but maybe those of lower age, yes. Uh, thanks, Prof. Moy, for information of, and inspiration. I have a question. Is there a vaccine for this COVID-19 in the future? Only once, but for a lifetime, it's effective. Oh. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, yes, this is the uh, vaccine of our dreams. You have just once, you have it once, and then you're effective uh, lifetime. Uh, a lot of people are trying to look for this and... Um, so the, we don't understand what exactly is the mechanism of infection and protection for this virus. So uh, in the sense of WHO, they will have uh, uh, to determine what is the proxy of protection against the virus. So in this sense, uh, if you understand what gives you protection against the virus, then yes, you will be able to develop a vaccine which is effective and uh, maybe for a lifetime. So currently, I, I don't think so. It's going to be very difficult. It's our dream, yeah? Yes. <laughs> uh, the uh, COVID-19 is over. It's our dream. Okay, uh, the next question, Professor Moy. Considering the mutation rate of coronavirus, do you think vaccination of coronavirus will be like influenza once in a year? Mm, I think this is more likely than the question above. Uh, yes, most likely you will get it maybe once a year or so. So uh, they will probably have to design a vaccine which, is, uh, which gives you lesser adverse effects as compared to what we have now. So I think this is the most likely um, practical choice of what I think right now. But unless uh, we find something which is very good, so uh, yes. 
Dear Professor Moy, as we know, for a vaccine that must be given to doses, what are the consequences if the second dose is not given? Not different, but it is not given, the second dose. And what are the consequences if the dose is given excessively? Okay. Uh, right. So the clinical trials has been done, even if, if with one dose, you will uh, get the IgG antibodies. Uh, which has neutralization activity against the virus itself. But if you don't do the full dose, full, full recommended two dose, then probably you will get a lesser immune response than expected. So uh, this is probably something which is um, not so good. But if you're given excessively, hmm, okay, there are some people which are immunized, uh, for example, two times, three times, four times. But uh, we don't exactly know. For example, if you are immunized um, too many times, your immune response may not increase anymore. So we don't know. We don't know whether that will happen, but that's not something that we want. But I would expect that uh, you still get an immune response, but it's not necessary to have um, excessive dose, especially when you have people which need the vaccine right now, which don't have access to the vaccine. So um, optimal dosing, which is recommended by the manufacturer is important. Okay, uh, last question, Prof. Uh, I want to ask again, Prof, how the effectivity and opportunity now from COVID-19 vaccines administered by inhalation and intramuscular as we did know? Uh, okay, yes, uh, there are some vaccinations which are introduced by inhalation. And um, the advantage of inhalation vaccine is because you get IgGs, IgA, sorry, which are uh, mucosal immunity. So you, it's, um, it's known that we'll be infected uh, through our nasal, um, through our, um, I mean, like through our, I uh, say, uh, when we breathe in the virus, we will be infected by it. So uh, it's known uh, for that. So if we have um, inhalation uh, vaccination, it will uh, benefit if we have IgAs uh, induced, they are able to protect us um, directly through inhalation of the virus. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the answers, Professor. And uh, how time flies. Because, uh, yeah, uh, our time is limited. So uh, we have to end the session again. Thank you very much uh, for your interesting, brilliant, wonderful presentation and explanation, Professor Moy. Uh, because it is very hot issue. Uh, we are happy that all participants can participate very uh, kindly uh, at today event and hopefully all the participants can learn from this lecture for all participants please uh, please give your reaction for professor moi mengli okay <laughs> lots of reaction <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much again, Professor Moy. Uh, and as a token of appreciation, we would like to kindly hand over the certificate uh, to Professor Moy Ling. Uh, please receive the certificate of, of appreciation. Uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. Thank you for organizing this uh, interesting session. I didn't expect so many response from all of you. And uh, <laughs> yes, I, yeah, thank you. This is the certificate for you, Ms. Uh, Professor Moy. <laughs> okay, I <Yeah>. receive it. <laughs> thank you. Virtually. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you again, Professor Moy. Okay, and now we move to photo session. Uh, please, our participants, turn on the video. For this photo session, please committee Mbak Alia uh, guide this photo session.
Okay, I will start to capture uh, all of the participants. One, two, three. Okay, the next page. A lot of page <laughs> because lots of participants, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, two, three. Okay. Uh, that's page. One, two, three. Okay, for the last page. One, two, three. Okay, finish. Thank you, Mrs. Fabrina. Thank you very much, uh, Mbak Alia. Finally, we come to the end of this event. Thank you very much for your kind participation. I will post this event with the quote from Martin Luther King. If you cannot fly, then run. If you cannot run, then walk. If you cannot walk, then crawl. But by all means, just keep moving. Okay, thank you all. Thank you so much. Stay healthy and see you on the next event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Thank you.